That's the Man of Steel practicing his own form of nuclear arms control in one of the more action-packed scenes from Superman 3. Superman 3 is just one of the films we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. I'm Neil Gabler. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. In addition to Superman 3, we'll look at a movie about a possible fascist takeover of the Italian government. The film is called The Salamander, starring Franco Nero. But Neil is up first with his review of the long-awaited film from famed Swedish director Ingmar Bergman. It's called Fanny and Alexander. If there were a Nobel Prize for filmmaking, I don't think there's much doubt that the first recipient would be Swedish director Ingmar Bergman. For over 30 years, Bergman has taken on issues like the existence of God and the nature of reality, and his quiet, austere, uncompromising pictures have become synonymous with the term art film. Well, now, nearly 65 years old, Bergman has made what he claims will be his last film, Fanny and Alexander. It's set in Sweden in 1907, and it's about two children named Fanny and Alexander, whose father suddenly dies. Their young mother is courted by a strict bishop. And in this scene, the bishop explains to the children's mother that he wishes to marry her. But there is one condition. Leksaker, dockor, böcker. Ingenting. Jag måste tala med Alexander och Fanny. Det är ditt avgörande, Emily. Jag kan avgöra för egen del, inte för barnen. Därför måste jag fråga dem. De måste offra något för sin morslyck. Nu är redan ont. Kyss mig. Well, over Fanny's and Alexander's objections, she marries the bishop anyway, and they all go to live in his stark, loveless house. Now, Alexander hates his stepfather's cruelty, and when the boy makes up a story that the bishop had driven his first wife and children to suicide, the bishop demands an apology for Alexander's lie. I feel that I have found the bishop and the Men vilket straff väljer du? Rottingen resinoljan eller mörka skrubben? Hur många slag får jag av rottingen? Tio slag, varken mer eller mindre. Då väljer jag rottingen. Ta två kullar där. Lägg på bordet. Knäpp ner byxorna, Alexander. Det 
Res dig upp, Alexander. Du har något att säga mig? Nej. Du ska be mig om förlåtelse. Det gör jag inte. Då måste jag ju slå dig tills du kommer på bättre tankar. Kan du inte bespara oss båda en så obehaglig upplevelse? Jag ber aldrig om förlåtelse. Du ber inte om förlåtelse. Nej. Lägg dig fram, stup, Alexander. This is one of Bergman's most emotional movies, I think, as you can see from that scene. Now, Fanon Alexander is also one of Bergman's most beautiful films, and despite those scenes, overall, it's his sunniest and gentlest. All of his old themes make sort of cameo appearances here, but instead of the solemn, dour, pretentious treatment that they've often gotten in his other films, Bergman seems to have come to terms with them all, and Fanny Alexander is a kind of testament of how love and pleasure and imagination make life worthwhile. As always, Bergman creates glorious moods and scenes. Unfortunately, he still doesn't have the knack, or maybe the heart, to be a real storyteller, so the film occasionally drags, and its own restraint is sometimes trying. But Bergman, bowing out wonderfully, has proved something you might not have suspected, that he's just another old <laughs> sentimentalist after all. Oh, I agree. I like the too, Neil. You use the phrase bowing out. It's as if all the old images Bergman has used in all his famous films make one last curtain call. And even though he's mm -hmm. denied that it's autobiographical, it was filmed in Uppsala where he grew up as a boy. And it's the first film that Bergman has used children as the principal characters, and they, in fact, the title characters. So there is much of what he probably went through as a boy. There's a loss of innocence. There's a coming to grips with reality. There's a coming to grips with the end of one century, which was a century of innocence, and the new century, which was not a century of innocence. There's all that all through this picture from start to finish. There are joys and sorrows and happiness. It's peaks and valleys and it's beautifully done. Yes, I mean that sense of innocence, that sense of joy, uh, I hesitate to say exuberance because mm -hmm. Ingmar Bergman is still too restrained to really be exuberant, but I guess Fanny Alexander is about as exuberant as he can get. This is sort of, all of his other films remind you of Chekhov plays, mm -hmm. but this is sort of like a Dickens novel. With a little it's, bit of Hamlet thrown in the middle, too. A little bit yeah. of Hamlet, but it's full of characters. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's full of Dickensian kinds of situations. It's much more of a story than his other films. Unfortunately, as I say, I don't think it's, it's as well told as it might be, but despite those flaws, there's a charm to this movie. Bergman has come to some kind of reconciliation, it seems, and you feel that in the movie. He has described it as the sum total of my career as a filmmaker, and also at the end, uh, one of the characters reads from Strindberg saying, anything is possible in life, all things are possible, and that's really what happens in the film. You get a look at all sorts of things in this picture, all sorts of levels of reality. Yeah. Typical Bergman in some ways, and yet because in a way you suspect it's about Bergman himself, and in some respects, atypical Bergman too. Because it's not pretentious. I often find Ingmar Bergman films so self-consciously arty and pretentious, this film is not. And when he says at the end of the film, quoting Strindberg, that the imagination essentially, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, can do anything, you feel that in the film. It's a kind of magical movie. Bergman's imagination at play doing everything, and yeah. it's a wonderful quality. It's like in a Woody Allen picture when he quotes author's message, author's message. <laughs> it's right there in front of you. It's laid out for you. But it's and a wonderful it works. message. It's a beautiful film. The three hours that this film runs went by very quickly for me. Well, let's go on to something a lot different, Neil. <laughs> a lot less significant, but still a picture which is just open around the country. It's called The Salamander. The Salamander is a messy, convoluted, difficult to follow thriller. Now briefly, it begins with the murder of a general. While investigating the murder, a dedicated Italian intelligence officer, played by Franco Nero, learns that the general had been part of a fascist plot to take over, over the government of Italy, and Nero begins a one-man crusade to stop the fascist coup. Now, in this scene, the murdered general's beautiful mistress has led Nero to a remote island where the general's secret plans for the takeover have been hidden. And here, Nero confronts the fascist soldiers trying to stop him. The situation, sir, is that I am under orders from General Leporello to maintain surveillance of Villa Pantaleone and to prevent the removal of anything whatsoever from the premises. You see, my friend, that boat out there has been lent to us by NATO. I'm discharging highly secret duties. You have placed a senior officer in considerable jeopardy. One incautious move by any of your men could have caused a fatal accident. It could have ruined this operation. You do see that, don't you, Captain? Respectfully, sir, I submit I'm only doing my duty. 
That submission, Captain, will be considered at the proper time and place, if necessary. Colonel, it won't work. Men! Oh, yes, it will work, Captain. Could you really understand every word Franco Nero said? They should have had subtitles. By the way, the title character, the Salamander, is a small role, played by Anthony Quinn, no less, an old World War II guerrilla who used that code name, we're told, and who now is one of Nero's few allies. But never mind the silly plot here. This contrived movie suffers from having too many characters, and all of them seem to be played by actors in the wrong roles. American actors, for instance, like Martin Balsam and Eli Wallach, play Italians. Balsam uses an Italian accent, and Wallach does not. You figure it out. And an English actor, Christopher Lee, furthermore, plays an Italian as well. But he talks the Queen's English. It baffled me. And, speaking of accents, Franco Nero narrates this overwritten story in English, so heavily accented, as you heard briefly there, they ought to use it for a code in some spy movie sometime. Names and places get jumbled here, and pretty soon, the salamander looks like just an excuse to round up a gaggle of international actors probably on European holiday, and have them churn out a movie, any movie. We forgot to mention how slowly paced this oh. movie is, how, how low-key, even the music is low-key in this movie. It's a thriller without thrills. Yeah, and one of the reasons it's a thriller without thrills, I think, is that <laughs> be, they, they keep on talking about this fascist coup, but the important fact is that no one seems in a hurry to stop it. Or scared it's of it. It's not imminent. No sense of danger It'll happen here. a month from now or a yeah. couple of months from now, and Frank O'Neill, who's investigating this thing, just sort of pokes around his business. How can we possibly care in the audience when he doesn't seem to really care? You also know he gets out of it because he's the narrator saying, oh, that's me there, that's me there, and he's, he gets tortured in one scene, and you know that he's going to live because he's the narrator. And then he starts naming names, and you have to associate which actor is playing which character. And by the time you get through with that, you have to understand his heavily accented English, and that doesn't work, so you're three or four thoughts behind what's going on in the story. It's so overwritten. It's ridiculous. And it's a cliché by now. Oh. The idea of one man against the system right. is such an old, hackneyed cliché that who really cares? We know how it's going to turn out anyway. Especially when it's done by a rather bland actor. You need somebody with passion here, and you really don't get it from him. Yeah, passion is one thing I would not attribute to oh, this no, movie. No. Well, now, our next film is Superman 3. But before we move on to that, let's see what happened before even Superman 1. Now, this week, we get the latest appearance of Superman in Superman 3. But the Man of Steel has been leaping tall buildings in a single bound for some time now. Superman, the first of the superheroes, was actually created by two Cleveland teenagers. And he made his first appearance in this action comic book in June 1938. The next year, he had a comic book of his own. And by the late 40s, actor Kirk Allen had assumed the role of Superman in two motion picture serials. These serials, called Superman and Atom Man vs. Superman, <laughs> were divided into 15-minute chapters. And one chapter could be shown each week in a theater before the main feature. In 1951, George Reeves, who had taken over the Superman role in the third and last serial, Superman vs. the Mole Men, starred in the Superman television series. Now, through it all, Superman continued fulfilling adolescent fantasies in his comic books right up to 1983, and he's been popularized all over the world. There's even a cottage industry for Superman products. But interest in Superman was really revived in 1978 with Superman the movie. For a new generation, Superman, now played by Christopher Reeve, became a camp hero who battled his own sexual desire for Lois Lane as much as he battled villains. How tall are you? Uh, about 6'4". Six, 6'4". Four. Six, four, four. And uh, how much do you weigh? Mm, around 225. 225? Two, two hmm. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, I assume then that the, the rest of your 
bodily functions are normal? Sorry, I beg your pardon? Well, putting it delicately. Mm -hmm. Do you... eat? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I do. When I'm hungry. You do? Mm -hmm. Of course you do. <laughs> well, well then, uh, is it true that uh, you can see through anything? Uh, yes, I can. Oh, well, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that you're um, totally impervious to pain? Well, so far. What color underwear am I wearing? Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I embarrassed you, didn't I? Oh, no. I did. No, 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 not at all, Miss Lane. It's just that this platter must be made of lead. Uh, yes, it is, so? Oh, you see, I, uh, I sort of have a problem seeing through lead. Oh, that's interesting. Problems in person. Hmm. In Superman 2, he won the battle against alien invaders, but lost the battle eventually against Lois Lane. You think I'm Superman? <laughs> Boy, you certainly have some imagination, Lois. <laughs> For a minute there, you almost had me convinced. For a minute. Bye, bye, baby. Bye, bye. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Excuse me, please. Come to think of it, Superman would be very dull without Clark Kent. Now, the idea of a wimp who is really the world's strongest man is a very powerful fantasy anytime, particularly for teenagers. But maybe it's not entirely coincidental that the two greatest periods of popularity for Superman, the Great Depression and the recent recession, were periods of national difficulty when people longed for a hero to make things right. I thought you were going to say truth, justice, and the American way prevails with the American That's flag right. flapping in the back the way they did on the old TV show. Well, now, of course, it's time to go on to Superman 3. This is a movie which has several plots going all at once. Now, by now, you probably know that Richard Pryor is in the cast as well, but that's just part of the story. We'll get to him in a minute. Oh, there's the obligatory usual threat to humanity here from an arch villain which Superman must defeat, and the usual escapades of rescue and quick changes in cramped phone booths. But there's also a gentler, more down-to-earth tale of Clark Kent's going back to his boyhood home of Smallville for his high school reunion. Here's where we see the tender side of the Man of Steel, as in this scene, where Superman, again played by Christopher Reeve, almost matter-of-factly rescues the son of his old flame, Lana Lang. Let's go see if Ricky's all right. You okay?
gosh, is he all right? Of course it's Superman. Who do you think it was? Now, Superman is gifted with superior intelligence. So are the producers of Superman 3, up to a point, because they built in a box office guarantee by adding Richard Pryor to this one, lest the public grow tired of just more Superman saving the world for the third time. Pryor plays a computer whiz working for a sinister tycoon who's planning to destroy and eventually control much of the world's coffee and oil supplies. In this scene, Pryor tells his boss, played by Robert Vaughn, just how super Superman is. Boss, it is not my fault. I mean, isn't it neat, though? What's not your fault? Superman. I mean, how was I to know he was going to start doing his thing when you started doing your thing? What are you talking about? What am I talking? It was just on television, man. Didn't you see it? Don't call me man. I just saw Columbia bite the dust. That's all I saw. You didn't see the man come flying out of the sky from the clouds. It was him with his cape flapping in the... <laughs> his cape was flapping in the wind. He was flying. He was great. He was just flying around. The cape was blowing in the wind like this. It looked like a flag. And he landed right in the middle of this big plantation. <laughs> and he looked, checked everything out, right, with his x-ray vision before he did that. And then he put these laser beams out of his eyes onto everything. <laughs> dried up everything, just like that. I'm talking about dried it up like the machines that they have in the men's rooms. You know what I'm talking about? The hot air comes out and you put your hands under there and you dry them off. Sometimes they don't work, right? But Superman's worked. And you think he stood around to take balls? Not this man. No, sir. He flies off again, right? And then he saw what really caused the trouble, right? He flew into the tornado, went down to the bottom of the tornado, and turned it upside down. He made the little end on top of the wing. It's going to go crazy. And then he landed. The big end was on the bottom. The little end on the top. It's the Ross. It was the, the big. <laughs> Superman's bad. Unfortunately, so is the movie. The earlier Superman films worked because they had pacing, wonderful special effects, and if not the comic book campiness I'd hoped for, at least the flag-waving corniness, which I found sentimental and appealing. But this time, everyone looks so tired, even bored, that the energy is spent. Richard Pryor is always funny, but he takes away from the aura and the thrill of Superman so much that Superman almost looks ordinary and mortal. Pryor's presence destroys the pacing, upsets the style, and looks like just a device to disguise the fact that the gimmick has exhausted its allure. As you watch the actors just going through the motions, you realize there's not much joy left in Smallville, Metropolis, or anywhere else here. I couldn't agree with you more. I love going to the movies, but I really hated going to see this picture. It's an awful film. It's cheesy in every single respect. Mm -hmm. it's, its special effects are cheesy. It's cheesily written. They haven't found a plot uh, or a villain who's comparable to Superman. Villain, just... look how bored Robert Vaughn looked as the villain. You need an arch enemy like Lex Luthor, an interesting villain. He just looked like he who was can be Superman's there... match, yeah. essentially. And he looks they like he's just even... sitting there uh, waiting for things to happen. The whole movie looks like an afterthought. You compare this to what George Lucas has done in the Star Wars saga. Every picture has gotten bigger and, and more majestic. Grown, yeah. These pictures seem to get smaller. The plots get smaller. They look cheesier. It's an awful movie. Yeah, and things are left out from the first two. They look like they dumped them onto this movie. <laughs> yes. It's a real disappointment. Yes, this is the this is the garbage receptacle for all the things that didn't make it into the first two movies. Right. Well, now let's summarize how we felt about the films we reviewed this week. We happened to agree on all three for a change. We both felt that Fanny and Alexander, Ingmar Bergman's final picture, was sweeping, exhilarating, and delightful. It's a wonderful farewell. So two yeses. We also agree on The Salamander, the thriller about a fascist coup in Italy. It is slow, dull, and incomprehensible, and there is absolutely no feeling of danger whatsoever. It looks like a bunch of actors on vacation. <laughs> Finally, we agree that Superman 3, with Christopher Reeve and Richard Pryor, is a tacky-looking piece of filmmaking. It's not funny, not exciting, not even interesting, and Superman has lost his powers. So two no's. So the movie to see this week is Ingmar Bergman's farewell film, Fanny and Alexander. Absolutely. By far. Absolutely. Well, next time, we'll take a look at the recent phenomena of glitzy Hollywood musicals. 
We'll explore their flash and their appeal, in contrast to the more traditional Hollywood musicals of years ago. Here's an example of what I mean. The current smash hit, Flashdance. The modern Hollywood musical, next week. So until then, polish up your dancing shoes and save us the aisle seats. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.